Each season, summer, fall, and winter, spring, the loft schedules a huge variety of writing classes. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce one of our teaching artists, Lizette Wanzer. Lizette, could you introduce yourself and tell us how you got involved at the loft? Uh, yes, as you said, I'm Lizette Wanzer. I am originally uh, from New York. I've been living in San Francisco now for about 17 years. And I've always taught through community and cultural organizations here in the San Francisco Bay Area, but during the pandemic, I had to convert to online teaching, which I was really resistant to at first. Uh, I think I waited six months, didn't teach at all, and then finally um, made the dive. So one silver lining I realized um, when I was teaching some write-ins, kind of like a meetup for writers, is that I was getting students from all over the country and all over the world. So I thought, well, there's a silver lining to COVID and to this whole um, pandemic and having to convert to online teaching. So I started reaching out to other organizations, uh, writers.com, which is based in Florida, and then The Loft, which I've known about for years and years. And um, yeah, they hired me. <laughs> yeah, lucky us. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and you you teach creative process classes and you also have a book 642 tiny things to write about which is about creative process so what is it that draws you to this topic so actually 642 tiny things to write about is a collaborative book from my studio the writer's grotto so we all contributed uh to that book and then i've made individual contributions to other books and then have a book coming out this fall um I'm sorry, what did you ask? <laughs> what it is that draws you to creative process as a topic? Um, it's actually more professional development that I focus on. And I do that because not too many creative writers get that, um, not even in their programs. If you do a BFA, if you do an MFA in creative writing um, or an ancillary field like comparative lit, you really don't get the professionalizing um, piece. It's, it's almost taboo to, well, it is taboo to talk about it for some reason about the reality of the market, how to market yourself, um, publicity and promotion for yourself as a writer, and just how to elevate your career. So I noticed that many, many writers in my craft classes didn't understand how to submit, how to write a query letter, um, how to find contests that were reputable and dependable and not just scams, um, how to prepare a literary CV and write an artist statement so that they can be competitive for applying for writing fellowships and grants, et cetera. So I carved out a niche for myself teaching professional development for creative writers. I do also teach in craft classes. I teach flash fiction and uh, lyric essay, but I really, really, my passion is um, professional development for creative writers specifically so that they can get armed with the tools that will help them get from point A to point B uh, with their writing careers. I think that's a really good point. I earned my MFA. I graduated in 2019 and I work in publishing and it is sort of amazing, right, that when I was in my MFA, there were so many things I was seeing in my job as a literary agent that there just feels like this total gap between what's expected of you as like a literary writer, right? And then what is expected of you if you want to be traditionally published? Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, being a writer, of course, it's an artistic, creative passion, but then you also have to have the business side. So if you want to be taken seriously, uh, as a writer who is going places and who is going to publish in uh, ever higher level literary journals and um, get interviews and be invited to present your work at conferences and give readings at bookstores and um, start landing some grants, you have to be able to treat your creative writing as a business and not just as an art. And the business portion is what's missing for most people and certainly I didn't get it. Um, so I learned everything the hard way and there's no reason that it needs to be like that. So 
Absolutely. And you mentioned before that you've contributed to a couple of other books and that you also have your own book, yeah. uh, Trauma, Tresses, and Truth, Untangling Our Hair Through Personal Narrative, which is coming out. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think being a contributor, right, uh, either to an anthology or an essay collection yeah. is something that a lot of writers don't totally understand. So could you talk about how you became a contributor and also what that process looks like? Part of what I teach in my professional development classes is the import of networking and making connections. So it's imperative that you have business cards, especially now that things are opening up again. You must have business cards. You should be carrying at least five of them with you um, at all times. You never know who you're going to run into. It's very important to be a good literary citizen. I teach um, being a good literary citizen in my professional development classes. What does that mean? That means making sure you're going to events. If you're a writer, you should be going to several uh, events per month, uh, going to attend an open mic, hearing maybe your favorite author give a reading. This can be virtually or in person. Um, supporting a friend who's having a launch or just going to hear an author that maybe you've never heard of who's at a bookstore or a museum or library near you and just supporting that person and participating in the q a session at the end and attending literary conferences even if you're not presenting because the networking portion is how a lot of these opportunities will open up so the uh, lyric essay is resistance that contributor opportunity opened up because I had published a couple of essays about lyric essay and somebody in, uh, I believe it was Minnesota, found me on there and contacted me through my author website and said, hey, we're putting together a panel for AWP, the big, huge um, mecca conference for writers that happens every year. We're putting together a panel on lyric essay. Uh, we read your pieces and we'd like to know if you're interested in joining us. Uh, so I said, absolutely. So that's how I got onto their panel at AWP 2019. So that was in Portland. Um, so I did that panel on lyric essay as resistance with them. And then at that panel, there was a publisher from Wayne State University Press who loved the whole panel and approached the, the uh, conveners and said, we'd like to do an anthology. So that's how I wound up being a contributor to that anthology. Um, wouldn't have happened any other way. Same thing with um, Trauma, Tresses and Truth. That was just a panel that I proposed again in 2019. And audience members came up to me after that panel and said, oh, where can we get this book? And I said, there is no book. And I didn't think it had any legs as a book either until the um, Brianna Taylor and George Floyd happened. And then the whole summer of racial reckoning happened in 2020. And I realized that yes, this probably does have legs as a book. So I invited everybody who was on my panel that I had recruited for that AWP panel to be a presenter. And then I went ahead and put out a call for uh, papers for the other 14 or so people um, that are in that particular anthology. And then the um, Chalk Circle Intercultural Prize winning essays, that came from me competing in a contest called the Soul, the Keats Soul Making Literary Competition, which happens every year as well. And the judge of the intercultural uh, category there, the intercultural essay category, decided to do an anthology of her favorite prize winning pieces from that category over the years. And mine was one of them. So that's how I got into that um, anthology. So sending your work out there, competing in contests, uh, making sure you're submitting regularly, you should always have something circulating. And then doing this networking piece is how you can find your way into the anthology. Same with the 642 uh, Tiny Things. That was a joint piece from my uh, writer's studio. And there's about 60 of us in that studio. So you, you mentioned, you know, teaching at a handful of different institutions. And I'm curious about what, you know, besides seeing that there's a gap in, in professional development, which could be filled in a handful of different ways, right? So what is it that drew you to teaching in a classroom, working with students one-on-one? -on -one? 
Um, you know, I started teaching only in 2015. And I always swore that I would not teach because I'm an introvert. And I knew I wouldn't like being up in front of people and having all these eyes on me and so on. But at my writer studio, uh, people kept encouraging me to just give it a shot. Just try teaching one class, a one day class and see how it goes. Um, and also to be frank, they were really trying hard to get more people of color to offer classes there because they were very interested in diversifying the student body. Uh, so I did do that in June of 2015. I think I taught two one day classes and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, and I saw that I didn't need to be quite as self-conscious that I was really interested in helping these folks um, elevate their careers and learn about writing and also the business of writing. And when one of them would contact me and say, six months later, maybe a year later and say, hey, this piece I was working on in your class, it just got accepted by such and such a journal, or I just got a second place uh, finish in such and such contest. It just doesn't get any better than that as a teacher. And it was so rewarding. And I love that. I love hearing good news from my students. Um, of course, there's a siren going by now. Um, so that is addictive. And just watching them use the tools they've learned in my workshops um, and have things happen for them. You know, one student got a grant. She had never even heard about this grant until she took one of my classes. She got $600 to help cover her airfare and hotel to um, AWP conference somewhere, that sort of thing. And I just love hearing those kinds of stories. Yeah, absolutely. Student success stories are, yeah, they just broke your heart. <laughs> the best. <laughs> and you mentioned before too that, you know, you had to learn all these things the hard way. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really what prompted you to, to take these classes. But are there other resources that you tend to point students to for them to understand more? Yes, they get a whole packet of handouts in these classes. So they get the top 10 tips for working on grant applications. They get um, examples of actual questions about um, how to talk about your writing. You know, why do you write that horrible question? Um, how to answer the why us question? Um, how to answer the why this residency question? And a whole lot of handouts about what not to do when you're working on residency and grant applications um, and what not to do when you're trying to present yourself as a professional when you're applying to read um, on a conference panel, for example. So it's, it's a lot of handouts that they get. And we do hands-on exercises in the class as well. So it's not, um, you know, I cruise and you snooze. I don't do lecturing. Um, everything's a seminar class and we do a lot of hands-on work right in class. We work on our LinkedIn profiles right in class. We write our artist statements, we write our author bios um, in class. They uh, workshop them with their peers and then I uh, correct them over a series of weeks. So it's very hands-on um, interactive stuff because that's what will get them the material to stick. And it also means they leave with real hardcore tools at the end of the class that they can use. Yeah, that is so helpful. And then of course, the hardest thing to touch on, but I feel like must come up to your, in your class is uh, rejection, right? Which anyone who is trying to be traditionally published or submitting to literary magazines or submitting for grants or conferences to be part of a panel is going to run into. So this is sort of a two-part question of how do you manage to be honest about the reality of needing to deal with rejection, but also sort of assuage that fear enough to give students confidence to actually pursue something. So I make it clear early on that rejection is part of being a writer. It's just part of being a writing uh, of a writer career and one of the tools, one of the most valuable tools that you need to bring to your literary career is a thick skin. And the analogy I like to use is that once you're finished your writing and you're sending it out into the world, 
you have to look at yourself as the surgeon and the writing as the patient. So when a surgeon is operating on a patient, they have to take a step back, right? And they have to be objective about what they're doing. They can't be emotionally involved with the patient or else how are they going to get their work done? Um, and so that's what you're doing. You're sending the story, the poem, um, the excerpt, whatever it is, you're sending that out, that's your patient. As soon as it's sent out and you've logged it into your um, professional submission tracker, that's it. Uh, forget about it, move on to the next submission in your list or go back to your next project. When the rejection comes in, um, go ahead and you know cry about it and try to keep it to two minutes. Log it in and then send it right back out to the next um, opportunity, contest, publisher, whatever it is that's on your list. And know that that market made a mistake in passing. It's their loss. Um, too bad for them. And just move on. Um, it takes some time to work up to that thick skin, but it will happen. And the more you submit, the sooner it'll happen. The other thing is, I tell students that getting rejections is a sign that you are a professional writer, right? Because if you're not getting rejected, you're probably not submitting. Um, and I have had students in my classes continue to meet after the class is over. They choose a library to meet at or a coffee shop. And I have one group of students that their goal is to get to 50 rejections. When they get, when someone gets to it, they celebrate. They go out for dinner, they treat the person, whatever. Um, which is excellent. That's just an excellent way to look at things. Um, and I've had, I've heard other student, uh, other teachers say they have students post their rejections on a bulletin board when they come in and everybody claps and so on. Um, we celebrate rejections in my classes too. Somebody who's never submitted before, they get a rejection and maybe it's even a warm rejection where the publisher has written something like, this is really wonderful work. We it's just not right for us right now. Please submit to us again. That's a warm rejection. We celebrate that as well. Yeah, no, I love that. That makes me think of Stephen King's book on writing when he talks about nailing his rejections to the wall and getting a full nail full and then moving on to the next. And mm -hmm. it's like, all right, well, if one of the, you know, I would say greatest writers, most successful writers of our generation can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> so can you. Um, well, I just, I have one final question. It's a bit more, you know, on the personal side to get to know you better. So you're a writer, you're a teacher, right? Obviously very busy, but when you aren't teaching or writing, what is it that you like to do? Oh, let's see. Hang out with my dog. Um, I really like being outdoors. I wasn't a big outdoors person before because I'm such an urbanite, but during a pandemic, I spent a lot of time in our parks um, on the, we have something called the uh, Bay Area Trail, which goes through a huge part of Northern California. Um, and so that has continued even though things are opening back up now. Um, I like coloring, so I have coloring books. Of course, I like reading. I also like reading children's books, including rereading my favorite children book, children's books. Um, and I do some freelancing as well. So I'm a freelance uh, healthcare slash medical editor for different healthcare uh, organizations as well. Great. Well, I so appreciate you taking the time to be here today. For our viewers, you can find Lizette's classes as well as our full lineup by visiting laugh.org slash classes. Um, and I'm very excited for your class this summer. All of your classes are always incredible. So. I highly encourage our viewers to sign up. <laughs> Thank you so much.